Devil May Cry 5, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, Metro Exodus, Kingdom Hearts 3, Fire Emblem Free Houses, 5 excellent games in 8 incredible release pump months and yet I managed to grind more than 40 hours in this year's remake of Resident Evil 2. Even though I'll count Silent Hill 2 was one of my favorite games of all time, I'd never call myself a fan of survival horror. I've watched several playthroughs containing everything from Fatal Frame to Haunting Grounds and Rule of Rose, as well as speedruns from Punchy and Carcinogen, but I wasn't ever thrilled enough to sit through most of the games myself. Yet this year's remake of the cult classic Resident Evil 2 has been on my mind ever since its release. Playing through Claire's and Leon's respective story was a satisfying blast. And yet I came back for a second, third, fourth and fifth run still not having enough. Everything from hardcore mode to the thrill of the ghost survivor stories wasn't enough to make me stop but long for more content instead and come back every other month or so. What's so different about it? The second remake captivated me with its use of the horror theming, mechanical depth and overall game design in a way other survival horrors haven't for a while. Most importantly though, it surprised me with something I'd call flexible genres throughout this video essay. So although it did take a while, hi, I'm Andy and I want to introduce you to RE2 Remake's genre switching gameplay, an analysis on the survival horror genre and its boundaries. The game which basically invented the survival horror term we use today was a bit of a rock star if you think about it. In 1996, games like Super Mario 64, Quake and Crash Bandicoot introduced accurate 3D controls with astonishing success. Yet the first Resident Evil took an 180 turn, decided for pre-rendered backgrounds, tank controls and static camera perspectives instead. While this choice is partially bound to the PlayStation's hardware, it's a stylistic choice as well, as it closely relates to the successful fruits of labor from years of horror movie experiences. A stylistic choice which integrated horror into the basic mechanics of the game itself, morphing every enemy encounter into a thrilling ride into the unknown. Every resource became scarce, and missed shots felt like a permanent hit to your survival chances. A stylistic choice which spawned several sequels and franchises with this ridiculously well-established formula. And yet, Kazunori Kadoi decided to go against all odds, turned away from the first remake's praised love for the original and introduced a dynamic third-person camera to Rezi's zombie-infested police art station. But where did the original horror go? Couldn't horror therefore be a bit more impactful by not knowing what's causing it in the first place? By playing around with the mechanics assumed by the player while never fully explaining them. Embracing the idea of subtlety in horror instead of relying on established tropes. There's two very basic concepts which Resi players have known for decades so far. Always, with no doubt, hit the head for more damage. If something is dead, it stays dead, including a puddle of blood or item drops. Point being, neither are true in the second remake. Head, body, pinkies, toes, it's all the same. It results in the exact same amount of damage. The only trade you're making is risking to miss the smaller head hit box for a potential critical one hit kill. Zombies aren't even too keen on being honest about their remaining HP as they have a chance of getting knocked over with every body shot and lay dead until you get too close. Do you waste bullets to safely check whether the opossum's really done for good? Are headshots worth the potential miss? Should you risk and dodge most zombies? Resi evolves into a game of probability, forcing you to think on your feet since ammunition is sparse and should be used wisely. Which is worth more, potentially losing a third of your health or a bullet for each uncertainty. Of course, math anxiety isn't the only type of horror, it's more of a constantly applied theme, deeply and suddenly woven into every encounter of the game. Being the lone survivor of an abandoned police art station isn't a pleasant feeling, especially when death is following you around every corner, both metaphorically and literally. <sighs> 
son of a- Lickers are my favorite enemies in the game and are masterfully designed to trigger a lot of our insecurities in horror games. The first licker you see doesn't feel like a regular encounter, almost like a midway boss screaming at the top of its exposed lungs. The beast blocks your way and feels incredibly intimidating. Its tongue snatches across the ceiling and then the beast charges at you as you take your first few shock shots at its grotesque body. Here's the catch. It isn't actually an obstacle. Well, kinda. While it feels as if you can't dodge the liquor, as if you're forced to fight it right here, right now, you can go against all your survival instincts and slowly walk towards it. <laughs> Snap! Well, it close the distance to you immediately. Even the enemy encounter music starts playing and gets you all pumped up for survival and combat, and amidst this horrid feeling of pure uncertainty, what if you've done something incredibly stupidly wrong and really should be running in this instant? There's no threat. Just pure, intensely designed horror gold. Lickers are never forced on you. Clanky controls are never the core reason for your loss. Only your decisions and susceptibility to horror. Well, except for these two stupidly unnecessary goddamn liquor jump scares. There you go, I just spoiled the only cheap encounters of the game. Real bummer. <sighs> Moving on. There's slightly more to survival horror than just the scary parts after all. We are hoarders. At our utmost biological core identity, we feel a strong purpose in collecting and keeping things. We store our belongings like our closest memories. Self-storage became one of the literal biggest industries in America. 250,000 square kilometers are being used right now to store our stuff combined. We never use our elixirs in Final Fantasy. Always have 30 more Pokeballs than we'll ever need. Never use our spirit emblems in Sekiro for anything more than two shurikens. And God forbid nobody's ever gonna say no to the very first pistol you receive in RE4. But if you never try use your tools except in the worst case scenario, how do you know if they're ever gonna be useful? This Aris remake brought a well-known game design decision with it to circumvent this issue. Bottlenecks. In my first playthrough as Rookie Cop Leon, I found comfort in using nothing but his basic pistol. Ammo management felt easy, as I never needed more than 6 to 8 shots for any threat in the beginning of the game. As I encountered the locked up shotgun for the first time, I was intimidated and longed for the right moment to finally try it. I grabbed it after a few hours, packed some extra shots, and, well, never actually came around to use it. My hypothetical perfect moment didn't arrive until late in the game, so my trusty pistol became my go-to for every single encounter until ammo became alarmingly rare as I thought less and less of it. As I hit rock bottom with my last magazine, didn't know where I was and suddenly ran into a gauntlet of zombies, it finally hit me. Fuck off! Or rather, them. This thing is so stupidly satisfying and much better for casual zombies than any other weapon in the game. In fact, why did I ever plan to get anywhere close to a hard-hitting boss with this thing in the first place? Why did I waste my precious pistol bullets for single zombies? This moment felt like I discovered something along the lines of the shotgun's hidden plus 200% critical hit chance dead by pure accident. It just wasn't an accident. There is only so much handgun ammunition in a police art station. And if RNG and Aimbot aren't your first and last name, you're bound to waste all of your shots by some point. The designers want to challenge your ideas of the in-game economy by slightly nudging you towards trying every weapon in different scenarios, constantly re-evaluating your personal best practice and adapting your playstyle. There will be times where you're better off storing your pistol and filling the extra spot with support weapons instead. Though, if you dislike the idea, you're given the tools to craft ammo for your preferred weapon of choice. And just as I got close to appreciating Leon's precise, hard-hitting weaponry... This fine gentleman reminded me of the one resource I haven't ever thought about until this point. Time. Handgun, SMG or shotgun for a simple zombie? Whatever was the fastest option. The liquor I always carefully walked by? Time to throw every flash, grenade and sparse SMG ammo I could find. 
Tyrant. The endless pursuer of this remake greatly remixes your decision making skills on the fly as every decision so far is questioned and reevaluated under the terms of safety, speed and amount of doors you can get between you and him. The very real shock of potentially losing hours of progress really makes you care. Tyrant even throws a few new variables into the mix as well, as he isn't as invulnerable as he looks. Several shotgun blasts might temporarily force him to the ground and allow you to build some distance. Whether this is worth it or not is all up to your personal interpretation of the economy. I absolutely love how he forces me to interact with the world, the decisions I've made and resources that I have at hand instead of forcing me to simply run, hide or run and hide in an instant. Implying of course you're not abusing his ridiculous delay after every single punch. Or how he can enter certain rooms for balance reasons. Or how Lycos can actually interact with doors at all. Or how dogs are tragically vulnerable to your door snapping exploits. Or how you can dodge zombies as much as you like. Change the or how you can absolutely you abuse zombies trying to play dead. Or how you can massacre how the zombies with a single grenade. As mentioned, horror is the fear of the unknown. Therefore, it is inevitably temporary and bound to fate. Part of the thrill of playing survival horror games is combating this horror and pushing against all odds, always slightly tapping the dark and feeling uncertain of your decisions. Though once the unwritten rules have been established, this precious thrill becomes stale. Especially when something as fragile as the enemy AI starts to slowly lose its sense of immersion, you'll notice the dense horror atmosphere crumbling away. And if the core mechanical gameplay, as in older games of the genre, feels horrendous to control if not fully accustomed to it, there isn't much left to offer that'll bring you back to play for another round. As crucial as tank controls, clunky combat and other limitations of the past have been for the survival horror genre, they've also been detrimental to the core experience of the games which implemented them. Scares get old quick, and without them, survival horror isn't fun to suffer through. Contrarily, in my personal opinion, aside from its incredible use of the horror theming in survival context, Resident Evil 2 Remake's greatest strength is the focus on fun and satisfying mechanics first things first. Unhindered free movement. No tank controls of any kind. Free aiming. Sprinting with no stamina. Quick switching both through hard hitting weapons and support arms. Doesn't Claire's movement remind you of other modern shooters? Since Ari Force release, the series evolved constantly. This game's basically the pinnacle of movement so far and morphed the one sturdy tank control beast into a comprehensive third person shooter throughout the years. A quite good one if I might add. Just seeing how smooth the movement felt was the first thing I noticed when starting the game for myself. As well as the overall great 21 by 9 support, I'm super thankful. This is great. Resident Evil managed to hit the perfect balance of being incredibly responsive and simultaneously a great horror game, in spite of the advancements and movement the series has made. A concept I'd like to call flexible genres within this video. The designers knew exactly how limiting the horror theme is and how their scares only work a set amount of times. But instead of forcing cheap jump scares, they're embracing the idea behind its limitation and morph Resident Evil into other genres as the time passes. After playing the A and B sides of the campaign, you have seen every major scenario and scare the game has to offer. That's also the exact moment when the fourth survivor unlocks. That's an extra scenario where you play as the human unit not killable, short hunk, and work your way through the entire mansion with enemies you've already seen for the past playthroughs with a preset amount of ammo, weapons and healing supplies. Your resources are predefined, you just have to make the best of them and reach the end of the intense gauntlet in a single go. The scary side of the horror theme is kicked out as the main drive of the game and rather used as a visual coding for the game world. Imagine playing Killing Floor or Left 4 Dead which both force you to fight horrendous Zeds and super mutants but don't necessarily scare you in subsequent playthroughs. Rather, they coat an otherwise good shooter with some great and unique visuals. As I played through Hunk's story for the first time, my heart kept racing and the thrill of this mode never left me. The entire mansion is remixed, yet filled with enemies and obstacles I've already seen so many times. It's just a tad more arcadey. Rezzy skillfully shifted into an incredible horror themed survival shooter and stepped away from the scary side of horror exactly when I needed it the most. Attentive Mr. Raccoon sighting survivors might as well have unlocked the unlimited combat knife by this point. 
Switching a single finite resource into an infinite one suddenly flips the game's core concepts upside down equally effectively. As I received a knife, I immediately embarked into a third playthrough and felt the satisfaction of knocking every single enemy to the ground by shooting at their knees instead of heads. The saved ammunition then made even quicker work of one's harder foes which I rarely approached in my first two sessions. Less wasting equals more resources, equals more shooting, equals ridiculously easy yet satisfying boss battles, equals S ranks. From a 12 hour C rank slog to a 7 hour improvement and finishing off with a speedrun worry 3 hour run as I confront enemies with an array of knife swings. And just as I saw every single scare, finally remembered every key item location and imprinted the in-game map into my head, Resi rewards me with yet another unlimited ammo weapon. And every future S-Rank playthrough will follow. As the unique selling points of Resident Evil 2's horror theming and survival context inevitably started to fade, the mechanical depth shone through the rocks and allowed the game designers to create an environment which works both for slow, strategical combat as well as fast-paced arcade shooting galleries. That's the power of flexible genres. This isn't you, none of this is, I hear the veteran scream, and I support that. Resident Evil always gave incentives to get better and faster with subsequent playthroughs. Even the free Ghost Survivor DLC was partially included in RE2's original experience. It isn't an entirely new approach, but a refined one instead. The big differences lie within the designer's priorities. Create strong mechanical depth first things first, and then create a great survival horror experience despite of the strong mechanics. This approach allows the ghost survivor and hunk scenarios to feel more like fletched out arcade modes instead of tacked down goodies. After all, they are accessible right from the very start of the game, not hidden behind multiple walkthroughs, not hidden behind the core gameplay like the RE2 original. The only thing stopping you is a spoiler warning, nothing more, as the mechanical depth allows them to be great standalone experiences. The remake of Resident Evil 2 doesn't get stale after the second playthrough. Only the horror does, but the mechanical depth owns up for it and morphs the core gameplay for the help of flexible genres. I still have to point out the obvious bits though. The Resident Evil 2 Remake isn't a marvelously incomprehensibly perfect piece of game design perfection. I got sick of the constant tension in my first playthroughs and needed several breaks. And so might you. I just genuinely enjoyed my journey with it and wanted to share it with you. Be it the overly cautious 11 hour Leon run or my current S rank hardcore extravaganza with Claire. I have probably missed a few things since I haven't played for every single survival horror game myself, so come right away with your opinions and ideas, I'm open for discussions. Last but not least, thank you. It's been a while since my last entry and I'm thankful for anyone still sticking around or just newly discovering the channel. Unfortunately my inner sloth and university both get the best of me, but here I am. I won't make any false promises this time, instead I'll tell you this. I'm definitely motivated to create more content for you. The discussions, critiques and heartwarming words underneath the Hyperline Drifter video genuinely surprised me and I'm thankful for the time you've invested into writing them. Therefore, I'm just as motivated to invest the same time for future content. I hope you've enjoyed the video and rebranding of the channel. I can't wait to come back for more and see what you're all thinking. Enjoy your stay! And have a wonderful life, everyone.